This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. And I'm Sam Mercier's. Got it in seven tries. Seven tries. The NPR opera puzzler. (laughs) Yeah? (laughs) The NPR opera puzzler? What are you talking about, Sam? Tell me more. Uh, Just on the Deceptive (laughs) Cadence blog, uh, they had uh, the... uh, this little thing where you try and match. I don't even know what the point of it was. It was just a game, and I got it in seven tries by using the force. Yeah. Let's see. Are you, uh, saying, you, don't, are you saying you don't speak, like, a number of different languages? No. I picked but out like, enough German to get one of them. And that, and it's I was, too bad I was you had to miss one. <laughs> the one, that's, the one <laughs> that was fish for sale, it just sounded like a fishmonger singing, so... Thought, let's go for it, and then oh, that's, the late... that's the one I got. Was, was the fish... <laughs> that's that's <laughs> the only one that was in English. Oh no, I, I guess I was thinking, of... but yeah, that the, was... the late rent notice just sounded like there was trouble brewing. You know, I kind of went that way. The, it also the one sounded with... like Labo M. <laughs> the one with a pair of aces sounded like uh, you know, kind of shady, like a gambler or something. I mean, I don't know. I just got it in seven tries, six out of seven. So they have a bunch of record. This is a pretty fun little game. You should check it out on the NPR uh, blog. They they've got a bunch of little samples from different operas, and then a bunch of little photographs that have to do with financial problems. And you have to play the little sample, and then drag it onto the picture that describes the financial problem that is happening in that opera. Yes, it's- and for me coding standpoint it works smoothly and perfectly which i was really yeah. surprised and happy about a lovely little nice. drag and drop interface good work in npr staff. good work npr always good stuff from those guys they do fine work yeah okay patrick i cut you off this week on <laughs> <laughs> sound notion what all right are we anyways about? yeah we'll be talking about the brooklyn phil's new season what's on for them in the uh 2011 2012 season um, what Frank J. O. Terry has to say about availability and disposability, and some classical music apps, um, if we so care to download any. I don't know. And you skipped one. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. Skipped don't forget one. the Dallas, Dallas Opera. Opera. Dallas Opera bails. <laughs> oh, man. They, what did they bail on exactly? They bailed on a Janacek Opera. They were going to perform right. a, a masterpiece of the 20th century. Uh, <laughs> And and they bailed on it. Of the 20th century. Yeah, I'm glad we know that they told us it was a masterpiece of the 20th century. Right. Otherwise, <laughs> how else would we know it? I mean, <laughs> it's it's an opera of the 20th century. It certainly isn't going to get performed, so we can learn about it. And also, Where did you this hear about that story. I heard about it on uh, Brian Dickey's blog, who is, I don't know what his title is. He works with the Chicago Lyric Opera. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, so let's, let's talk about. Go for it. Let's <laughs> let's start with the Brooklyn thing. All right. That sounds good. A um, lot of most death happening. That's all yeah. I can say about that. Um, most deaths all over the place. A lot of a lot so, of cool. Well, we're talking about the, the Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the Brooklyn Philharmonic's recent announcement of their forthcoming season. Right. Right. Let's see what we're talking about first. <laughs> no, we, we talked about that. There's most deaf, you know, most deaf, <laughs> Brooklyn Philharmonic. It's know. perfectly logical. But wait, what does most deaf have to do with the Brooklyn Philharmonic? <laughs> An excellent question. What does most deaf have to do with the Brooklyn Philharmonic, gentlemen? Well, it appears that they're um, going to have a number of high-profile composers and, and artists, I guess, or, uh, pop artists. Um, that will be joining them throughout the season. Not to mention, um, let's see, Elena Dovla- Dovlatov, who is Sergei Dovlatov's widow, uh, play a concert with um, the Brooklyn Phil Chamber Players. Um, so aside from, it's like a really dynamic season that's up for them. And yeah. it's something that's good, seeing as though they don't really have a, a house to sleep in or anything like that. Um you know, I think they have the license to be a little bit... I mean, that's what Brooklyn Phil is about now, especially as, since Alan Pearson came aboard, and even before Alan Pearson came aboard. Um, they were all a little bit... They were kind of like an urban orchestra, I guess. Would you, would you say that's right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that um, that a lot of people don't... A lot of cities don't have an orchestra like this. 
um, it's it's not the primary orchestra of that metropolitan area. You know, most most cities aren't large enough to support more than one professional orchestra, like uh, like the New York Philharmonic and the Brooklyn Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the interesting things that we're seeing from their programming are because that they have the luxury in some ways of competing with the New York Philharmonic. You know, they, I I as much as we love Alan Pearson in the Brooklyn Philharmonic, they're a different thing than the New York Philharmonic. Um, and, and it's going to be hard for them to compete with the New York Philharmonic on Brahms. I'm not, well, that's, the, that's the thing. They, they, that orchestra isn't competing. Um, I, I think they lack yeah. that, that whole idea. Like they're, two completely separate entities and the New York Phil does this and the Brooklyn Phil does that. The Brooklyn and, Phil and I'm is going to be they doing much do cooler that. stuff. Exactly. Right. It's, it, I mean, they, yeah. they can't compete with, with the New York Philharmonic on Brahms, so they do this other thing, which is yeah. not only good, good business sense, but thankfully it's, it's good art too. Yeah. For all this other stuff they're doing, the New York Philharmonic can't compete with them. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Exactly um, right. As part of the the Mos Def, the concert that Mos Def is going to take part in, part of that involves the uh, remix Beethoven remix project that they're sponsoring that will culminate in a concert next summer. Yeah. Um, it's they're inviting uh, Mos Def is going to be involved in it somehow. I'm not sure exactly how, but the one in winning remix will be performed, and it's uh, the finale of Beethoven's Eroica Symphony remix. So I don't okay. know. I mean. There is links to it on the website. I'm not sure what they're doing about copyright and all that kind of stuff, but if it, they're doing it and they're advertising copyright with it, Beethoven. There's a <laughs> Well, so it has to be a recording of somebody doing the performance That's true. too. It's probably, kind of thing, I mean it so. could be them. Yeah, yeah, right. They've got those resources for sure. What I'm saying is they they're obviously ha have taken that into account, so uh, that sounds really interesting. I think we should enter a sound notion remix. Absolutely. Well, they're, yeah. they're doing things with writers and poets and stuff. I really like that. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, concert, that one concert involves Lena Horne and Mos Def and uh, Beethoven, and it's a big mixed bag. It's hard to say exactly what it's going to be, but it's going to be interesting. An yeah. Another thing I'd like to point out about this uh, schedule that you can see on the Brooklyn Philharmonic's webpage is that about half of the concerts are totally free. And the yeah. ones that are not free are still relatively cheap. Yeah. Which is kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and it, I think it's another way that they can compete with the New York Philharmonic. Do you think... That's uh, another thing that puts job. them out of New York Philharmonic's league. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think I like the way you joining... put that. They're out of the New York Philharmonic's league. That's right. Yeah. Go Let ahead. me ask you guys. Sorry. Do you guys think getting a job... Winning an audition or something with New York, uh, with the Brooklyn Philharmonic, most people see that as something that leads to something else, or is that that is like a serious, you know? They they might have looked at it that way before, but if things stay this cool and you know, they they keep doing cool, inventive community engagement projects like this, I don't see why somebody well, wouldn't want to work there. Well, the and hiring is, rock just, stars like Alan Pearson. Yeah, I just they don't have like a whole lot of money. Going around, and so well, I don't. I, I don't know what it's like to to be a musician in the Brooklyn Philharmonic right now. And that's, yeah, they also don't play a full schedule. I mean, this is. I don't think we assume that this is any of these people's full time gigs, right? They're, right. They're, but like their I, new I, season that they just announced doesn't have that many concerts. Right. I'm just wondering if this is like if if this is a stop on the way to like a a, a major symphony orchestra or something. If if most people see it as this. Ooh. Maybe it is. Maybe well, this is the thing. Like Greg Sandow's taken a lot of heat over the last few weeks, talking about um, on his blog about getting rid of all these old musicians and orchestras and hiring a bunch of young guns, and maybe they won't play exactly the same level as those uh, experienced players. But hopefully, they would play differently and with some kind of energy that those older musicians don't have. Maybe that's this kind of thing. Maybe that's the benefit of an orchestra like this that's not necessarily a destination job for everybody in it um but you'll have always young players that are always willing to try new things and and play with a different kind of energy i can i can imagine um 
older orchestra players being very cynical about something like the Eroica remix with Most Def. Um, and it's something that I think younger players are going to be more get more into and play different. <coughs> yeah. Agreed. Yeah, and you know, if these people do go on to get, quote, real symphony jobs, they're going to take an expectation that, you know, a, a, a symphony job can be way cooler and way more engaged with the community <laughs> yeah. like this one is. And it also so. vindicates the Brooklyn Philharmonic when those people do get those other jobs. That's right. So, so anyway. I'm, no, it's not probably a destination gig for a lot of these people. Maybe the Brooklyn Philharmonic can become a destination gig for people that want to do this kind of stuff. Yeah, but I would, I would say right now it's probably not just because they don't have the cash. I would right. love to see the scene change like that, where these cool smaller groups or the chamber groups or like any of those other organizations might be the destination job. Yes. I mean, because there's so many people out there that like vastly prefer chamber music over orchestral music and, and stuff anyway. So that like or that, that kind of format, maybe not the repertoire, but right. <laughs> well, a lot of cool stuff going on in Brooklyn, even though they don't have money. And then uh, in the middle of the country, we have the Dallas Opera bailing on performing. What's the name of the opera, Dave? Uh, Katya Kabanova, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, and I don't really care. Uh, well, it's a Janacek <laughs> opera. And uh, was it? did they say anything about why they canceled? They just canceled? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think it's we're, we're to assume that it's just for financial reasons. Mm. Um, that they, they, they weren't selling that many subscriptions or that many individual tickets for that opera. It's not that far away. It's in October, which oh, wow. for an opera, the, 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 you know, the kind the of advanced planning that goes into an opera, that's pretty far into the project in July. So, so that means they sent some people home from work. When they canceled that one, probably. Well, I don't know if they're just canceling it or if they're replacing it with Carmen mm. or something Einstein like that. Einstein on the that. beach. I'm sure they're not replacing it with Einstein on the beach. <laughs> they're canceling it so they can play some... Marriage Donat of Figaro. Some Donizetti crap. We don't know that yet, though. We don't, it, it, but... Yeah, we, should, we should take odds on, on whether or not the thing they replace it with will be newer than 175 years old. Well, it could be 125 years old if it's late 19th century it's Italian right. well, it's stuff. Newer than 100 years old, let's say. Yeah. What, what do you want to take the what's the over under on that? Well, I'll, let's let's set a year. We'll set the the over under on the replacement opera is in 1878. Okay. I'll I'll take the under. I'll take the under. Oh. Uh, well, I'm I'll under take, as well. I can't I guess I can't really set the over under and take it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I'm under 1878. Okay, I'm under 1878. All right. I'll take I'll take over. All right. Okay. We're we're putting some serious it. money on this. Hopefully the IRS <laughs> does not watch Sound Notion. Right. Yeah. All right. I, I, I missed right. the bet. So, but which way are you going, so, Dave? So Dallas, <laughs> I don't get to pick. Oh, okay. I set the line. Uh, um So Dallas Opera, shame on you. Right. Um Next next up I think we should go to uh our our buddy Frankie J. An awful lot of alliteration. <laughs> Availability, archivability, <laughs> and disposability. I thought this was a pretty good article. Um as is a lot of times the case, it made me think about a lot of stuff we talk about on the show already, the effect of new technology on people's listening habits in a very general way. Um what'd you think, Nate? Sorry, I'm. Are you coughing up a lung over there? Yeah, I had a cold all week and kind of just recovering. What do you think of this uh, article from from Franco Terry? Well, I mean, he's just kind of rehashing stuff we talk about a lot: the ubiquity of anything you want um, to look at or find. Um, as a sort of a, a a tip of the hat, he mentions, for instance, you know. Uh, the summer phenomenon where there's the one big hit that you hear nonstop sort of against your will all summer and then it's gone away and sort of intimates that that's sort of, at least at first, <coughs> that's a disposable piece of music. Uh, but then mentions that, you know, well, maybe not because all this stuff is kind of permanently available now once it's gone through its pop cycle. And as to prove that point on the article, I posted a YouTube video to Walk Like an Egyptian 
that's got almost five million views. And to me, that's the way more salient point. It, it goes through its, uh, you know, those songs went through their pop music cycle and were on the radio constantly, but pe- lots of people still want to hear it, you know. Yeah. It, at least Raise your hand if you're sick of hearing F- Katy Perry's firework every time you go to a grocery store. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he makes that point of, like, you hear certain songs a lot against your will. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, this is something we've talked about, and you know it's one of my big things. Like, imagining that people take compositions or music or anything else the same as they did 50 years ago or 150 years ago is to me just preposterous because the way we understand use music what can we do with what we can do with it what it's used for all that stuff is different now yeah you sound Um, like one of the ethnomusicologists that he references in the article saying that's completely linked to the culture and the time and everything that's the nicest thing anybody's ever said about sam receers is that he sounds like an ethnomusicologist yeah well well, i i wanted to i was thinking i should coin a phrase that i'm sure has been coined at least in some form by someone else already but uh, to me it made me think about we're in a post masterpiece uh period like um, not that we, you know, when, when new pieces were premiered 150 years ago, I don't think people said immediately, oh, that's going to be in the canon. That's a masterpiece. You know, we've sort of retroactively applied that, uh, label to a lot of pieces that have been around a long time, but just the idea of trying to make a piece that is a masterpiece, like that's your goal. I think that we're moving past that music is, you know, uh, more about sharing and communicating rather than you know, sitting in your hovel coming up with something that's going to enter the canon and be a masterpiece. To me, it is. Anyway. Or at so least for a lot think, of people, it can be about that. So do you think when you're walking into a store um, and you are hearing the same songs over and over again, this radio station plays Katy Perry or whatever? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's um, what I hear every time I go into a store. <laughs> well, is that's that what I'm going to hear at night now. <laughs> I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> Is that an imposition for you? No. I mean, an imposition? No. That's right. Like, so, so that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I would, I, if I had the option to have some music or no music, I'd probably choose, like, more often than not, some music, even if it's just, you know, pop music that I've heard over and over and over again. Well, you know, as long as it's the kind of pop music that's easily ignorable. Um, like elevator you know. pop music? Well, like if they were playing selections. That's what I think of like that kind of stuff is though. It's yeah. elevator pop music. Uh, it's, if they were it's playing selections like from Uzak, though. If they were no, playing selections not. from Frank Zappa's first album, I might find that distracting at a supermarket, you know, but you know, Free Fallen <laughs> by Tom Petty, I've heard that 5 billion times and it's got a pretty simple song form and you know, when it comes on, I can either think, "Oh, this is cool," or I can completely turn it off. What what I used to call carpet music, you know. That'd be an interesting thing to, like, see or be be in a supermarket and do a study on people's shopping habits when you put on like some of the faster movements of Einstein Don't think on the Beach for or one something. Minute, don't think for one minute that that hasn't already happened. Yeah, I'm sure it has. Okay, I mean, let's just... open our own supermarket, the Sound Nation supermarket, <coughs> and we're right. gonna play like Barrio and Stockhausen all day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and see how much see see how many candy bars we sell. We won't have any looky loos. Um. <laughs> if you're gonna come in, you're gonna come in, and then you're gonna leave. Yeah. No, Dave, I don't. I I figured you wouldn't be for something like an actual store. It would be an online store to where you'd have to listen to music in your headphones while you're oh, shopping. Oh man, and then people just wouldn't come because that's crappy. Yeah. <laughs> one one really It'd be cool open point. source. One well, really cool point. Are you I mocking think... me? <laughs> Let's throw every free computer thing out right now that we can think of. <laughs> It'll run Linux. We're gonna have to crowdsource the game though for it. I don't know. Yeah, we need to use some social media buzzword. I think uh, one of the more salient points he makes in the article is about how uh, classical music has kind of been losing its presence on the radio, but the classical stations that do hang around are no better than the pop music stations that play the very limited set of songs all day long. I mean, here in Lansing, Michigan. We listen to the classical radio station a lot at work, and it's the same thing over and over. And you're going to hear a Mozart symphony. You're going to hear a Haydn symphony. You're going to hear a Beethoven symphony. And it's going to be one of the ones that you hear a lot of, you know, every day. That to me was an interesting thing. Like reading this article, I was 
evaluating the way I listen to music and my selection and how it changes and everything. And I think I am a little bit of that obsessive re repetition kind of listener of like picking a couple of things and listening to it over and over again and trying to dig in. And sometimes it's out of like wanting to pull more out and sometimes it's out of just like not changing the stuff that I have on my playlist or not changing the things that I have on my desk or on my iPod or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like there's, there's two sides to that of like some of this music really kind of lends itself to that <laughs> repeated listening of more than just two or three times. And, and also like, I wonder if that's tied with that masterwork or that masterpiece kind of thing of like, I mean, if, if this music is a thing that's going on, it's continually sharing ideas instead of making a piece for this decade and having that be the thing, then like, yeah, you can't really spend too much time on it because that conversation is going to go on without you. Right. Um, yep. Well, Sam, you mentioned uh, the classical station that you listen to, and that's public radio. Mm -hmm. This... I think he specifically says commercial classical music stations, and those those are going away really quickly. We had one here in St. Louis for a while that I loved, and uh, they played a pretty good uh, cross section of everything. They played, I'm sure they they played um, Eroica a lot, but they also even even in, within classical music, they played some more obscure composers. And they they played their their share of, of newer music as well, and they're, they're gone now. They, their their station was bought by a, a conglomerate of Christian music radio stations, and now they they're called Joy FM, and they play uh, they play Christian music all day long, and their their <coughs> operations have been subsumed by um, the local public radio station, and now they're only you can only listen to them on an HD radio or on the web so hmm. it's kind of kind of going away and i think that kind of thing is happening left and right all over the place mm -hmm. um but at the same time web radio makes stuff like that more available something like q2 that we've talked about before on this show a uh, project from wqxr in new york city um is is a, is a streaming radio station that plays a lot of new music and they can do it because they don't actually have to support the same uh, level of engagement uh, with uh, f for a for a physical over the air radio station. It's much cheaper for them to just do it over the web, and they can reach a wider audience. Yes, and, and most they people don't... listening to that classical station aren't listening to it in their cars either. Right, but you can. And the, you can well, you, certainly you can. But I mean, when you but, build because... something as a web radio station. Like, I'm not thinking, okay, I'm going to listen to this on my drive to whatever. So that's not the first thought that pops into my right. mind. Right. Well, that's going to change. Yeah, it will. <laughs> and, but the reduced, the reduced infrastructural costs in doing it as a completely web-based thing make it so that the decreased ad revenues a station like that can expect are easier to handle because you don't have to pay as many people or a brick-and-mortar structure or anything like that. So anyway, that kind of goes along with what we were talking about last week with borders closing right. and classical music consumption. And speaking of classical music consumption and technology, Dave, why don't you uh, drop some knowledge on us <laughs> for these uh, commercial radio uh, – commercial radio gets classically trained um, smartphone apps for classical music. Dave is the smartphone expert in the group, so let's have it. Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe I am the smartphone expert in the group. You are, Dave. And we expect something cutting and insightful or we're going to be very disappointed. <laughs> okay. Get it. Yeah. Well, here's, here's, here's something cutting and insightful. The New York Times published an article uh, by Bob Tedeschi this week uh, on smartphone apps for classical music. And um, I didn't install any of them on my phone because they all sounded like they sucked. Mm-hmm. They sounded like they all were mostly concerned with what I like to call top 40 classical music. Mm -hmm. um, the article specifically mentions maybe four pieces. Uh, it was the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto, number one in B-flat, that we've all heard a billion times. Wagner's Ride of the Valkyrie, that we've all heard a billion times. 
the Grieg Piano Concerto in A minor that we've all heard a billion times, and the Mozart Einkon and Nox music, which I could live the rest of my life and <laughs> happily net ever hear again. Right. So I'm not really interested in any of this stuff. Uh, maybe there are people that are, um, but these are. I think I think people that like this kind of stuff are people that go to classical music concerts because they think that that makes them smarter or something like perhaps, that perhaps but like take the we don't really know what we're doing and we're not sure how to get a younger audience and you know all of that stuff and make it into an a, a smartphone app that's what these these apps seem to be like what's the point you know i mean they're smartphone apps sure but they don't really do anything cool they don't they don't they don't suck any of the marrow out of the technology or, you know, they don't make themselves a platform for people to connect or anything like that. It's just like basically radio station kind of apps. Yeah. So are you guys familiar with Instant Encore? No. Tell us about it. Mm -hmm. um, Instant Encore kind of when it first started, I don't know exactly when, but um, they wanted to bill it as this kind of um, classical musician social network thing mm -hmm. that never really took off like that. Um, but now some professional organizations and professional musicians use Instant Encore um, with their web page, or they have it linked to their web page so they can add dates for performances they're having, um, have video and music clips and everything like that. So it kind of like makes their whole music world on Instant Encore there. Um, and it says here, um, New York Philharmonic, like you can have your own Instant Encore app. So there's, I guess there's a New York Philharmonic app and there's a Thomas Hampson app and there's a Chamber Music Society app. And it says they offer live video of concerts or full concerts for on-demand audio streaming, which I think is a pretty neat feature. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. I mean, they've got a big list of concerts, tickets and details. You can add it to a calendar. The thing about this is, in you know, if it's going to be a social networking site, it only works if people use it and only if those people generate content. And, mm -hmm. you know, a platform that's supposed to be generating social content, you got to make it like Facebook works because they make it so easy for people to do things that generate content that fill news feeds that people are going to click on and link on and this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so that requires buy in by a lot of people and methods to generate content that generate the content without pissing people off enough that they don't want to use whatever the platform is. Well, I think Instant Encore like, saw that it wasn't taking off like that, so they changed the, the idea of what it was going to do, which is yeah. now just basically a tool for your own website uh, yeah. and your own presence online just to add just stuff. Um, I don't know. I like the idea of uh, an organization or a musician having their own app to where I could click on it um, or, or use it on my on my phone and put in earbuds and listen to like a live concert or something or a concert that has been previously recorded and see oh I, you know I didn't get to go to this concert at wherever and now I can listen to it you know for free through their app or something yeah so that's that's great but I, I question whether they would be able to get any compelling new music on there because there are a lot of licensing issues with streaming and making available uh, new music that are not an issue when you deal with older music. They still, for an orchestra like the New York Philharmonic, they're still having to deal with the uh, performer issues and, and the the uh, recording and distribution side of their CBA with their musicians. But uh, with new music, it just becomes that much more complicated. And I, and I wonder if they're able to um, make something <coughs> as as compelling for the kind of music that we're interested in as they are for the music of dead white guys, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I, that's true. I mean, you can find a recording of Mahler whatever anywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, you. I think these apps are specifically for people who are in love with the organization or who are in love with that artist. You know, people go crazy over, you know. I don't know, Lisa Batyashvili or, or whoever, um, you know, a, violent, a famous performer or something like that. They just like the personality. They like their, if they have an online presence, they like their online presence. And that's why they buy these apps. I think them. these apps are for people that go to gas stations and buy things like 
Excerpts from Paco Bell's Canon played on classical guitar with soothing ocean sounds. Yeah, yeah probably. Well, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe for something like that. But the, I'm I'm just talking specifically about the 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 specific instant encore apps for people. Um, Patrick's like, ventriloquism it, career is coming right along. That's very <laughs> impressive, Patrick. No, <laughs> like the video said, is. There we go. We're talking about your video problem. Oh, you were oh, am, I, up. am I working? You're, you're, you're working good again, again now. <laughs> okay, good. Like they talk, <laughs> like if there's like a Renee Papa app or like a Deborah Boy app or something like that, people are, the Deborah Boy fans are gonna buy the Deborah. The people who don't know about classical music aren't gonna buy the Deborah Boy app. They're gonna buy the 100 greatest hits of classical music ever and listen to three minute excerpt of it. Maybe. That's why the Deborah Boy app exists. Is for the Deborah Boy fans. You understand? Do you have the Deborah Boy app on your iPhone, Patrick? I do not. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? And I like I like Deborah Voigt. Don't tell me, don't get me wrong. She has a beautiful voice, but um, I don't know. I'm not. She's not. She's not app worthy yet for me. <laughs> I don't even know if there's a, if there's an, a Deborah Voigt. I'm sure there is. There must be. We should look that up. It's an app for everything these days. You know. <laughs> yeah. Does uh... I was thinking there, there's an app for <laughs> that. Like, there's an app for that. That's old yeah. man Blighton talking. <laughs> there's an app for everything these days. Tap this, tap that. <laughs> All right. So while if... we're talking about technology and digital things, I would like to insert a short public service announcement. Oh, cool. So I uh, started writing music when I, I'm 27. So when since I started writing music, computers have been around to help me out with that, especially with the production side at the end. Um, and so every piece of music I've ever written exists in a digital format on the hard drive of my desktop computer. The hard drive of my desktop computer failed one week ago today. Um, and I thankfully have several backup solutions that I'm running. So if you are, I know we have a lot of composers and performers that listen to the show. There are some things that are easy to get back. If you have a CD that you've ripped to your computer and saved in your iTunes library, it's pretty easy to do that to get that back. You get the CD and put it back in the drive. But if you've written a piece of music or if you have a recording of one of your performances and your computer crashes, you are SOL. So please, please, if your creative output is in a digital format on your computer, please back it up. I have a backup system called Carbonite. My friend Tim uses Backblaze. There are a lot of cloud backup services that are fantastic and you should use them because if your house burns down and your only backup is sitting next to your computer, it's done too. So please yes. back up your stuff. That was end of public service announcement. All right. Mine's okay because stone tablets don't burn. That's right. Sam's old. <laughs> All my music. <laughs> Sam's music is actually so old that it's now been fossilized and That's right. uh, future generations uh, or you know us today can it's, go and dig it up in Sam's backyard. It's so old, they're going to start playing it on the local classical music radio station. Oh, Boom! Man. <laughs> Boom! Um, speaking of classical music and, and the radio, uh, I, this is not a good... Uh, I wonder if they have an app for All Things Considered on NPR. I can't imagine uh, that they don't. Because there's a story on there. Uh, a tradition shattered. Israelis play Wagner. We didn't cover this. I didn't know if it was supposed to be in the show, but we no, said it was No, I think mentioned. we should. I think it's good. It's a good story. Yeah. In Israelis play Wagner at... Bayreuth. Bayreuth. Bayreuth? Well, I'm Bayreuth. glad you said that because I was not even going to come close. And so the name of I, had a, piece I had a Russian music is... history teacher when I was in undergrad, <laughs> and so I don't know how to pronounce anything. So I've had to go back and learn things, like, how to say things again. And she used to say that Beirut, but I'm pretty sure it's Bayreuth. Okay. If, if you're German, please correct our pronunciation. And, and what's the name of that piece, that Wagner piece they played? Siegfried. Siegfried Idol. Oh, yeah. yeah. Siegfried Idol. Sorry, I didn't, I, I'm not looking at it. I just knew it was something, from, something related to Siegfried. So anyway, everybody knows that Wagner, uh, at the very least, you could say he, uh, you know, um, well, I don't know what to say about him, but he, he was an anti-Semite. Let's go with that. He was yeah, an anti-Semite. He, he wrote he an essay an... called Jewishness in Music. 
Not right. a fan of Jewish people. Right. So it's been sort of an unspoken thing that they're not going to play um, his music. Um, and in the, Israel. In Israel. But the Israeli, is it Israeli Chamber? Yeah. Yes. Israel Chamber Orchestra played uh, Siegfried Idol and uh, uh, members of Wagner's extended family were in the audience. Um, so, you know, it's uh, these kinds of things happen, and it's a sort of a moving on exercise because um, a lot of people really appreciate Wagner's music uh, regardless of what his personal feelings were. And, you know, I'm kind of a fan of that too. I'm, I'm not one to say you have to understand all this deep personal stuff about a composer to like or dislike their music. I personally don't like Wagner's music, and, and I don't care that he was an anti-Semite. I just don't like it. <coughs> well, the conductor isn't Israeli. The conductor, uh, I don't know where he's from, but I don't think he's Israeli. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, his name is Roberto Paternostro, so I kind of doubt it. Um, if he is, he's got some other heritage in his name um but he he said that he he's always loved wagner's music and and one thing he says um in here is, is if 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 a holocaust survivor came to him after this concert he can't say just forget about wagner's anti-semitism or about this his terrible words against the jews which i think is an interesting thing like you 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 can't expect everyone to take this the same way and he doesn't and he's okay with people taking it differently right roberto paternostro was born in vienna okay hey yo nice. <laughs> but he's from jewish our parents. correct research yeah, team right. in new york city <laughs> <laughs> thanks patrick Gulo. um do you what do you guys think about a culture saying like what do you think about the whole idea of you know israel having this this unwritten rule of not performing Wagner do you, I mean like we I'm I'm not from a from a persecuted I mean, it, group yes <laughs> so I, I feel like I don't I don't have any I can't do that I yeah I but know, I when I was reading this insight. my feeling was you know I think it's interesting and we should mention it and people should read about it and see what they think but you know yeah. in a large way I don't have a horse in the race you know so I don't feel Qualified is not the right word. I don't feel like I have license to say anything of importance about it because it doesn't really involve me in the way that it involves some people. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, I'm neither German nor a Wagner lover nor a Jew. I kind, of, I kind of said this when we were talking about the Steve Reich album cover last week that I don't feel personally engaged in the issue. Um, and I don't feel personally engaged or emotionally engaged in this particular issue. Um, so I, I apologize again if this offends anybody. But, but I you, think, would, you understand why someone would be, though. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I, I think it's in, kind of I, childish is not the right word. But I think we should be mature enough to um, respect somebody's cultural contributions you know, obviously Wagner had a, an amazing effect on all of the music that was after him. And I think it's okay to say that you like his music, but you don't ascribe to his political beliefs. Is it, can't, can we all separate those two things in our minds? Or is that unreasonable? I think it's perfectly reasonable for some and not reasonable for others. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Um, like, like, like Sam said, you know, we don't, we don't really. I don't have license to really give a thoughtful comment on this because I'm not from a first kid group. Yeah, I think it's it seems like a good thing to talk about. Unless someone Discuss, calls I'm me sure. calls me some Guido or something like that, I don't really care. Yeah. Well, I, so I, I should I, stop calling you that. <laughs> Actually, I don't care if you call me Guido. I, I, at all. <laughs> Since we were talking about Wagner, I wanted to find this quote because we've mentioned it on the show before. Michael Moncure quote about uh, Wagner said his music is better than it sounds. <laughs> Which, you know, to me, that's, that's like that's sort of like tipping your hat to its influence on <clears throat> his contemporaries and those that came after without while also saying, you know, I, I, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of Wagner's music myself. I just realized its importance. Mm -hmm. Anyway, 
So speaking of cool, influential music. What do we want to do this week about our pick of the week? Um, I, I say we, I say we, we got to, I mean, we can. Having her on the show would be so good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what, if, what if we skipped the pick of the week this week? We were supposed to have Missy Mazzoli on in our show this week, and it was going to be awesome because she's awesome. Uh, but I, we, we, we somehow missed her on Skype this morning. We're um, sure it's our fault. We're reasonably right. certain that it's my fault, right. actually. Yeah, I blame Dave for everything. As well, you should, because most of it's my fault. I mean, if you here's the thing: if you blame me for everything, ninety five percent of the time you'll be right. So I think we um, should hold off and do it when she's here, we, and try and get her back on the show. In the meantime, let's let's throw this um, video that I took. Um, All right, let's yes, do it. tell us about this video, Patrick. <laughs> so a couple weeks ago, um, the Metropolis Opera Project put on a um, a concert of some short chamber operas by um, upcoming composers, young and upcoming composers in the New York City area. And um, one of them on the program happened to be a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in years. Um, his name is Zach Redler. Uh, the librettist he worked with was Sarah Cooper. And um, they were the first uh, they were the first opera on the program. I think there were maybe six short operas that were being um, wow. that were on the program. Um, okay. And sounds like Sam's idea of a wonderful <laughs> afternoon. Six operas. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were short. They were they were very short. And the one I heard their their opera, um, which was called Breakfast, which is part of a, a which Yum. is going to be part of something called Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner. I just heard Breakfast. Um, nice. But uh, it it was it was neat to go to that concert. I only stayed. At, you gotta understand, it was so freaking hot, and there was no air conditioning. So I actually only stayed for his performance. Uh, <laughs> the performance of their opera, but yeah. um, I would have liked to stay for the whole thing and heard other operas, but I was just dying, and I was holding up the camera for for the whole thing, so it was like, <laughs> ugh. So I had to get out of there as soon as possible, but it was a really neat thing to go to, and there were nearly nearly 100 people there in a really, really small enclosed space. Um, you know, everyone had brought their friends, and it was very lively, a lively bunch, so I'm glad I got to go. And uh, so let's take a look at um, what I heard. I'm here with Zach Redler and Sarah Cooper for their performance of Breakfast, part of a three opera triptych. What? Why so upset? Are you kidding me? Why so upset? Why so upset? Are you kidding me? Six months ago, we were approached by our director, uh, Noah Himmelstein, and um, he had this idea for writing an opera with someone uh, combined with someone else and we just started loving our ideas the other opera fell through so we just wrote three you ate without thinking and you didn't eat at all how is that even worth it to recall sarah how's this been collaborating with zach oh it's good zach is my favorite collaborator so he's my primary we, we love working together <laughs> Have you been active in writing uh, librettos, or librettos for chamber operas and such? No, actually, Zach is completely responsible. I, I didn't know anything about opera before Zach, so he is my introduction to the opera world. What about the plot of this opera? What can you tell us? Uh, we're about to go in in a few minutes and listen to it. Um, what can you tell us just about about it? Sure. Um, it's interesting because we're we're a little bit more character-based writers than we are plot writers. I mean, there is a plot basically before the day before this, the world has ended. Doesn't matter how, but the world has ended, and these are the last three people left on Earth. Um, it's a family: a mother, a husband, and a son, and they just have to deal with all of their problems now that they're all that they have. Um, the father is so fed up with these two people. The son is dealing with the fact that he's never going to be an adult because once his parents dies, he's just going to be alone. Um, and the mother is so in denial of this that she can only keep um, focusing on the routine of this breakfast. Um, and you'll be seeing the first 20 minutes of it, or first 18 minutes of it. We 
we've started writing uh, dinner, which is the third one, and then there's also lunch, which will be a, a light lunch, a short, a shorter, maybe like 10 minute, uh, whereas breakfast is 35 and dinner is about 35, 40. Um, and yeah, they could be performed, hopefully, as a set or um, individually, uh, we hope, just to be able to spread it around. Uh, what can you tell us a little bit about um specifically the music, uh, the notes, things like that. <laughs> you know, t to put it blunt, uh, t bluntly, um, you know, what is your music like? Uh, that's a hard thing to say. Yeah. Um, well, we, because we come from, I mean, I'm a classically trained uh, pianist and percussionist and, and theorist and all this kind of stuff, but because I mainly write in musical theater genre, it's a little bit more um, tonal than contemporary opera tends to be these days. Uh, so though it's based thematically, it's based uh, on, on development and all this kind of stuff, there is a lot of uh, polyphony and um, pantonality, but uh, it is based in a tonal kind of area. So it was really nice to uh, get to talk to Zach and Sarah about um, their opera. Um, I hope I can, you know, I look forward to seeing more performances like that. And the Metropolis Opera Project seems like a really neat thing um, to follow because they constantly are, they're advocates for new music, and you know, we're all for that. So hopefully they'll be continuing to do more stuff in, like that in the future. Yeah, that's something, uh, we talked a little bit about this, and, and hopefully when we get Missy on, I'll, I'll get a chance to ask her about it. Um, I, I noticed looking through Missy's website um, that, she is also working on a chamber opera right now, and I'm and, and seeing this Janicek opera get canceled in Dallas makes me think that maybe these chamber operas are are the way of the future. And we've we've seen more we've seen more chamber operas recently from composers. Uh, is that something you guys think is is taking off, or is it maybe that I just never noticed it before? It's a more accessible group. Um, Could be taking I, off. I mean, just as as just. It's it's easier for newer computer, n newer composers. <coughs> uh, yeah, it's not as expensive to do. Yeah, less yeah. of an undertaking yeah. all around. And I should I should say on I just saw a couple days ago or something I saw Missy's Missy Mazzoli's, uh Twitter feed and said it said I just now finished the opera like that nice. minute. It was cool. pretty interesting. Well, that's why we're holding off this week on having a pick of the week. We were going to have just to make sure we're clear a thousand tongues. By Missy Mazzoli, which is a cool piece. Which is awesome. Piece. You need to listen to it. And yeah. we're all wanting to wait because everybody was jazzed about the piece and everybody had a lot to say about it. And uh, so hopefully we'll get her on again sometime soon and we'll talk about that piece. So if we're going to announce the pick of the week for next week, I think we have to say this. It's either going to be Missy Mazzoli, A Thousand Tongues, or it's going to be Chris Schultes with his new band piece called Openings, or going to be somebody else. <laughs> if, if if we can't get either of them, we'll, we're we're going to pick something else. But hopefully, That's we'll correct. have either Missy or Chris on the show next week, and we will be able to use one of those two pieces. Uh, Chris Schultes's openings on his CD is the CD out yet? Yeah, it's available okay. on iTunes. So, is, uh, what's it called, Sam? The CD is called. Is that backwards? It's backwards. No, to it's, me. Well, it's no, back. No, it's fine for us. Okay. Have you said arrow? Yeah. Is it arrow or something? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and we're only going to be talking about the band piece, but there is a song cycle and a piece for wind ensemble and soprano sax and a piece for piano also. Um, but openings, the uh, band piece, is the one we're going to be talking about. So check that out for sure. Good, good new stuff. And there's a, a really interesting review of it on New Music Box by Colin Holter that you should check yes. out. Yes, he does the whole CD. We're going to be doing just the one piece. Yes. We gotta get Ken on here again someday. Yeah, we do need to he's on our list. Our <laughs> list of people he's we on, like. He's on our radar. Yes. Our good list. Yeah. Our good list. Friend um, of the show. So let's I guess I guess no with no pick of the week this week, we're gonna wrap up a little early. Uh so if you have any questions about any of the stories that we did get to this week, uh or if you have any comments on any of our strange and bizarre opinions Feel free to share those comments with us on our website. You can find the, the website for this show at soundnotion.tv slash sn, and you can leave us a comment there. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. 
If you like the show, we'd love for you to share it with friends or donate using the links on our site to help support us. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by our very own Patrick Gulo. Thanks, Patrick. And Tyler Lepp. Uh, thanks again for watching, and we will see you next week.